Welcome to the Reason Roundtable, your weekly libertarian podcast from the magazine of Free Minds and Free Markets. I am Matt Welch, joined by Nick Gillespie, Peter Suderman, and Catherine Mangu Ward. Hello, everyone. Howdy. Hello, Matt. Happy Monday. It's Matt with a T, Nick, not Max. I thought we went over this. Uh, I thought it was Matt with three T's. <laughs> Does this Monday have a name? Is it like Hurrah Monday after Easter? Oh, that's not mm. uh, not Matt bad. Matt is risen. Matt take, is risen. Yeah. Take your uh, your video game playing son to work uh, day. I think it Kevin, is for me. From what I understand. Uh, all right, we're going to get to the uh, Center for American Progress's uh, sudden concern with the cost of tariffs here in a moment. But first, friends, do the price fluctuations of crypto make you seasick? Are you dubious about the long term reliability of the index funds and blue chip stocks? In your 401k? Well, CSN Mint has got some shiny silver coins for you to consider adding to your investment portfolio. CSN Mint, one of the most trusted names in the numismatic arts, has been providing certified U.S. Mint collectible coins and precious metals for over 20 years. They're particularly bullish right now on silver, which is trading way below its all-time high despite having plenty of industrial Usage uh, in electronics, solar panels, medical devices, and so forth. CSN Mint can offer you coins, bullion bars, collectibles, all with certificates of authentication graded by a third-party professional for purity and origin. If you're going to collect something, might as well be money. So go to csnmint.com slash roundtable. Use the promo code roundtable to get a free silver American Eagle. That's a $30 value with your purchase of $75 or more. That's csnmint.com slash roundtable. Do it today. You'll be glad you did. All right. Uh, last week, the Center for American Progress, that powerhouse Democratic DC think tank and political holding pen, came out as a wretched hive of neoliberalism. <laughs> I'm kind of kidding, um, but not fully. Cap as they call them in D.C., yeah. uh, with Catherine and Peter, uh, published an analysis of uh, once and future President Donald Trump's proposed across-the-board 10% tariff on all imported goods and found that the policy would amount to a, quote, roughly $1,500 annual tax increase for the typical household, including a $90 tax increase on food, a $90 tax increase on prescription drugs, and a $120 tax increase on on oil and petroleum products, this tax increase would drive up the price of goods while failing to significantly boost U.S. manufacturing and jobs. End quote. Catherine, I'm really excited that lefties are calling tariffs uh, tax increases. Does that mean our uh, progressive friends are ready to get fitted with Scott Lincecum T-shirts? Um, they are very, very welcome to join our party. I am happy to have them here. And yes, the T-shirts will be given out at the end in the swag bags uh, with the Scott Lincecum warnings against tariffs. Uh, right. So this is, you know, it's it's partisan. Obviously, it's partisan. Obviously, there will not be any attempt at, you know, ideological or philosophical consistency. So we can assume that there will be a pivot uh, if there is a second Biden administration and Biden continues to do what he has done, which is um, aggressively interfering in industrial policy for various political ends. Trump's version of the across the board 10 percent happens to be a, a little bit novel and dumber than the usual, um, but it's still of a piece with what has been going on for a long time now, which is that both the Democratic Party and the Republican Party have casually decided to be uh, strongly in favor of this type of manipulation um, for what is ostensibly often kind of sort of national security. Uh, my my old next door neighbor, Jake Sullivan, the national security advisor, is, um, mm. you know, he's he's been on the record saying this explicitly stuff like when private industry on its own isn't poised to take the investments needed to secure our national ambitions that perhaps the state what? can step in. Uh, but it's the same stuff that like Orrin Cass was saying before in you know 2018, 2019, where he, he would say over and over, uh, like, sure, the political interference in these markets will be imperfect, but it can also improve upon the industrial status quo. Very much to be determined, friend. 
I am not uh, not at all convinced that uh, Joe Biden or Donald Trump screwing around with our industrial policy will, in fact, improve on the status quo. Uh, Peter, uh, the to be sure uh, graph uh, from the Center for American Progress happens in the very next paragraph, which starts like this. To be sure, <laughs> <laughs> specific tariffs aimed at addressing a specific problem, such as forced labor or dumping of subsidized products, can play an important role for U.S. trade policy. But Trump's idea to slap a tariff on all imports, 60 percent of which come from Canada, Mexico, the EU, UK, Japan, South Korea, is reckless. And, quote, uh, what's your sense of the comparative differences between the two major party presidential candidates and their trade policies? To be sure, there are differences. <laughs> there you go. But yeah, they're not gotta, that big. You got to give that in the second paragraph, Peter. Yeah, it's Come true. on. Play the formula. I, I just, I wanted to, to forefront the, the to be sure there because the, the, to be sure, they're kind of the same. This is the thing, right? Is to be sure they're kind of the same because what what happened here was Trump put in place a bunch of very bad tariffs, and then that started a, a kind of a, a low level trade war with China, where there were retaliatory tariffs. Trump, of course, promised that his tariffs would be great for Americans and for American workers, and then of course, what happened was because of the retaliation, the tariffs were terrible for American workers. And in fact, there was a bailout of uh, uh, American farmers, I believe, uh, uh, some number of billion dollars, I don't have it right in front of me, but like, because the Trump tariffs were so bad. And so they didn't help anybody. They made tensions worse with China. And then what did Joe Biden do? Joe Biden basically just kept them in place. And his administration has continued to defend those tariffs. Uh, it's not just the Center for American Progress, it's Biden's own trade rep, uh, the, the cabinet official who was in charge of this, Catherine Tai, who as recently as this year, just a couple of months ago, was you know out there saying that trade uh, that tariffs are an important defensive tool for, and this is a, a summary from Bloomberg for rebalancing unfair commercial relationships, you know, and, uh, with especially especially with regard to China. So it's not even it's not even that they're arguing that they're necessary for national security. It's that the Biden administration is just saying that we are that the the Biden administration should be in charge of manipulating the economy through tariffs. And Trump is saying, well, you know, so should I. Uh, he wants to do it, like Catherine said, in a more aggressive and dumber and I think more obnoxious and probably more destructive way than Biden is doing it currently. But it is the same basic theory, which is that the president and that the, the administration should be in charge of the economy in a, in a fundamental way and should be deciding about this stuff. It's also just really ironic. The, the, to be sure, uh, the, <laughs> the, to be sure, the, the Center for American Progress report has a has a point about Trump's tariffs like they're fundamentally correct. They are directionally correct about the problems that they would cause and about the ways that they would uh, effectively serve as a tax hike and a price increase on American consumers. And it is just so ironic that if you look at Trump's uh, at the big economic messages that Trump and his MAGA world uh, Republican Party associates have been spreading for the last year or two, that basically boils down to two big economic messages that, that Trump has been uh, uh, promoting. One is the economy under Joe Biden is bad because prices are high. And two is Biden will raise your taxes. And so what is Trump's response to that is a policy that will make prices uh, higher and also effectively raise your taxes. It's just incredibly ironic all around, to be sure. Nick, what do you make of the um, kind of uh, all over the place public uh, opinion on this stuff? Oftentimes, uh, individual tariffs, especially against red China, um, are popular. Um, also, uh, increased prices are super not popular, nor is inflation. Uh, what to make of it, what to do with it, as far as you're concerned? Uh, one thing that's important to remember is that Trump also put tariffs on the EU, uh, as well as Canada and a couple of other countries that we, and Mexico, or was trying to do so. Um, although then he did sign a, a, a new deal with uh, Canada and Mexico. But it's not just that. Matt, the most fascinating thing about free trade as, as a kind of political football and everything like that, as far as I'm concerned, is that according to Gallup in 2020, 79% of Americans said that they thought free trade was good for America. And that's like an all-time high. During the heyday, right after NAFTA was passed and things like that in the late 90s, early 2000s, it was only about 55%. And as it stands now, uh, Gallup says it's like 61% of, uh, of Americans are in favor of free trade, 
which is still much higher than it was 20 years ago. So we're actually weirdly in an era where Americans are on board with the idea that free trade is pretty good. This is another instance where they don't have any way of expressing that politically because you have two parties that are talking about increasing tariffs or or commanding, you know, directing the economy in various ways. The one thing that you can say for sure about Donald Trump is that he has turned the Republican Party into a party against free trade. Uh, again, going to um, um, uh, Gallup, in 2022, only 44% of Republicans said that they thought that free trade was an opportunity to help the American economy by increasing exports. The number of Democrats who believe that was 72%. Um, so you've seen this actual significant change. And it's hard for us to kind of grasp or take seriously because for all of our lifetimes put together, you know, added up and, you know, on top of one another, the Republican Party has always been the party of free trade, but it is not the party of free trade anymore. And yet Americans are in favor of free trade, but there, we cannot express that through a vote for either of the major party presidential candidates. And I think one of the things that we need to get back to is, you know, really making basic arguments about why free trade is good and why free trade is beneficial. And, you know, a lot of stuff, uh, a lot of the things that get tariffs slapped on them are things like aluminum and steel. And both Trump and Biden have talked about wanting to bring manufacturing of that back home. But that there's a fundamental economic mistake there, which is that aluminum and steel are inputs in a lot of higher value products that Americans produce here, including things like cars and car parts and, and you know, other types of kind of materials that get finished here. And, you know, the argument against slapping a huge tariffs on steel and aluminum is that a very small percentage of the American workforce is making those things here, but so many other industries depend on them. It's like saying we want to take a we want to protect a small industry that will jack up the prices on everything else. And I think getting those kinds of you know basic economic arguments, which I think we had won when NAFTA was being passed and when the WTO was being debated and things like that, we've got to get back to making those arguments because people understand it, but that you know our our understanding of why free trade is a good thing needs to be constantly refreshed and updated. Uh, Catherine, I'm reminded when, with Nick talking about that of the famous uh, Al Gore Ross Perot debate, right? Yep. Over uh, on Larry over King, to, on Larry King Live, Dubuque, hello. Um, uh, about that, and that was a moment when like third way Democrats were were you know leading the charge of neoliberalism uh, and such like back then. If you go and look back at all the State of the Union addresses, which I do sometimes. Um, you'll see uh, discussion by uh, American presidents from both parties constantly about how we need to, to complete the Doha round or whatever, the uh, the uh, the Paraguay round of GATT or the precursors yep. to the WTO. It was understood for many decades to be fundamental to American policy, to be the leader of the global tariff reduction regime as part of a way to build up the strength of the sort of free and democratic West. Um, don't really see that much anymore. Can you talk a little bit about the part of the uh, Scott Lincecum t-shirt uh, that warns about what happens between countries when we are in a tariff raising posture as opposed to a global tariff reduction posture? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, th this era that you're describing of the of the U.S. leading the way in reducing tariffs and just kind of opening up trade, whether through kind of multi-party trade agreements or bilaterally, like it's true. There used to be just kind of in the laundry list of the State of the Union, there used to be always a like, hey, just a reminder that we're still trying to finish the paperwork on whatever trade agreement is pending. Um, that is the reason that people say like libertarians have been in charge for too long. Like that, <laughs> I think like the most charitable interpretation of that weird sentiment that pops up sometimes uh, when uh, when we libertarians are getting squashed between the two sides of the horseshoe is um, that our our argument for the power of trade was ascendant for a long time in a kind of you know moderately bipartisan way, um, and uh, of course the uh, the Scott Lincecum T-shirt 
uh, reminds us the tariffs not only impose immense economic costs, but also fail to achieve their primary policy aims and foster political dysfunction along the way. I have it in gray. It's a very nice. It looks nice in gray. <laughs> Is it a, a gray um, wash, like a washed gray? No, Distressed. it's just, it's, it's, you know, it's got a nice, it's a more of a saturated gray. I I've would got say. it in a see-through black mesh. Oh God, really, yeah. please, please erase my memory. Um, so the V-neck, the political dysfunction part of this is real. Like there is just an absolutely, um, this kind of like playground sense of fairness that happens, uh, when we stop moving toward openness and toward more trade and we, we start saying, uh, oh well, we're we're going to impose costs on um, on imports from a particular nation uh, to punish them for being bad uh, or whatever it is. Um, you know, this has a natural result, which is retaliatory political dysfunction, and we're just going to see a lot more of that. So much of this gets snuck into political discourse under the guise of being good for Americans. But it's not good for Americans broadly. It is occasionally uh, designed, you know, occasionally it will prop up a very narrow group of Americans, a certain subset of workers. Um, and that is just true of, of all of the kind of Trumpian and Biden uh, administration, industrial policy and national economic policy. But this is also not new. And this is something that I that I do think we should think about here a, a little bit is that this is not a, a brand new tendency that just popped into politics in 2024. Last week, I talked about the old John Carpenter movie, They Live, and that movie is about a drifter worker who shows up in Los Angeles because times are tough and he lost his construction job, you know, probably in Denver or something like that. And he's drifted into town and he finds construction work, uh, you know, in a, in a home, in a community with this, with a bunch of other kind of drifter types who are down on their luck. And there's this big kind of, it's not a monologue, but it is a, it's a sort of quasi monologue discussion where, um, where Rowdy Roddy Piper, who plays plays the protagonist, uh, the, the wrestler, right? And, and another guy sit in front of a palm tree and magic hour in Los Angeles. And they just talk about how the elites in America have screwed the average workers by offshoring work. Um, you know, but uh, they don't quite mention trade policy specifically, but it's very much this idea that they don't care about ordinary American workers. And so They've given the jobs to foreigners and they've preferenced foreigners and they've allowed foreign goods to come in and take American jobs and it's anti-American and it doesn't help them. But in fact, if this sort of protectionism and, and industrial policy, this kind of national economic policy doesn't help most Americans. Most Americans are worse off and we have seen that over the last several years where these policies have raised prices and contributed to inflation, which is the thing that people dislike most about the economy currently. Nick, you were saying something. Maybe about uh, how we're going to start the uh, well, low price party. I was going to point out that uh, palm trees are actually imports to Los they Angeles. Are. They are not native. So, uh, you know, it's many, many good things come from outside of whatever your local area is. I am, uh, you know, kind of fascinated in looking at this about why did uh, positive attitudes towards free trade continue to grow? Uh, after, you know, during the Obama years and even during the Trump years. And I remember remarking in a couple of different contexts, you know, that what Trump had done was kind of like in the same way he had pushed uh, positive views of immigrants to new highs in American history. He did the same thing with free trade. Um, and he also did something really great by renegotiating or negotiating another, essentially a NAFTA deal Canada and Mexico are our two biggest trading partners. Canada, uh, China is a, is a semi-distant third from that. That was smart stuff. And like, and again, I think this is the type of thing where a lot of people are so trading in slogans and kind of vibes or you know emotional gut feelings, making clear, you making making explicit the underlying economic arguments for why free trade is better. We, we just need to keep doing that because people don't understand the reason and they're they're stuck in moments where they are like, you know, fuck the Chinese, fuck the EU, uh, fuck Mexicans, fuck ca Canadians. And of course, we all can get behind the Canadian problem. But, um, you know, there's very clear logic on this. And that this is, you know, what we need is cheaper inputs into things that will allow us to make more expensive good things that we not only use in America and have them more cheaply, but then export to the rest of the world. All right. Speaking of trade, uh, last week, a massive barge uh, that had lost power rammed into one of the supports on the Francis Scott Key Bridge in Baltimore. 
basically obliterating the whole bridge. We've all seen the footage, uh, sending six construction workers to their probable deaths. They've recovered two. Uh, the accident basically shut down the port of Baltimore, uh, which is super not great for all that free trade uh, stuff that we uh, all enjoy. Peter, um, looking at the accident and the rebuilding, what are some uniquely libertarian uh, policy insights we might ponder? So I'm just going to be channeling Eric Bame here the entire time, a uh, Reason reporter Eric Bame, who wrote a great piece uh, looking at the Foreign Dredge Act. The Foreign Dredge Act is not something you hear about very much, but it's basically just the Jones Act, except for dredging. It says that if you're going to do dredge work in a harbor, you have to be an American company. And this was a protectionist law passed around the early 1900s uh, designed to protect American industries. What has it done? It has made Americans worse off in a bunch of ways. So because you are restricting the supply of labor, that just means that there are fewer companies, fewer workers uh, that you can contract with. The, the labor supply is just not there. But the other thing is, by shielding American companies from competition, what they've done is they've ensured that American companies have not kept up with the time. Their equipment is out of date. Their work practices are out of date. They are going to be worse at the job than if we could bring in foreign companies that have, that have competed better, that are doing better work. Um, and so they've made things more expensive. They've made the quality of the work worse. And they've also made the labor supply This law has also made the labor supply uh, as smaller, which is not great when you have a, a real crisis like this. It's not great all the time, though. And this is, I, th I think, you know, sort of one of the problems is it's unfortunate uh, it, it's unfortunate that the, the bridge collapsed, uh, but it's also unfortunate that we have to wait until a bridge collapses to start talking about things like repealing the Foreign Dredge Act. These policies are bad and destructive all the time. It's just that they are particularly bad and destructive in times of crisis. Catherine, what is something that occurred to your robot libertarian brain watching that bridge go down? Well, I wouldn't say that this occurred in the moment that the bridge went down, but um, immediately after, um, the folks who died or who have been lost from the bridge... Um, I think it's worth talking about those guys for a minute because um, those were foreign workers. So I guess not not dredgers because that's probably illegal. I'm sure actually they can employ foreign nationals. I don't know. But um, the um, the workers who were on the bridge at the time of the collapse were from El Salvador and Guatemala and Honduras and Mexico. And they were doing a hard job. Uh, they were, you know, filling potholes. They were doing repair work on the bridge. And um, just a really, really classic example of uh, exactly what, you know, what I think motivates me to be pro-immigration. These are guys who had families. Um, they were, you know, supporting people back home. They were supporting people here. They were doing they were doing super hard work and um, by all accounts doing it well. By all accounts, they were, you know, the, the quote from one of their colleagues is that they were all humble, hardworking men. Um, and I believe it. Um, you know, this is this is, you know, and it makes it all the more shocking that, um, you know, some folks in the kind of immediate aftermath of the collapse of the bridge tried to kind of hand wave that maybe somehow this was the fault of our wide open borders, um, that somehow like the foreigners had done it, I guess, or something um, exactly the opposite. You know, these the people who were trying to keep that bridge in good nick, who were trying to keep it, you know, functioning and healthy for Americans to drive over it and for our stuff to go under it, um, all had had come here from other countries. And um, I think, you know, it's absolutely a tragedy that those guys died. And I, I hope that they get their due um, and not the that they get kind of um, scapegoated along with their fellow immigrants for anything that goes wrong. Nick, you saw some of that scapegoating on uh, television, I understand. Uh, well, I, I saw it on YouTube <clears throat> oh, because yeah, yeah. I uh, really don't use my TV for uh, live broadcasts anymore. But uh, Maria Bartiromo of Fox, who was Joey Ramone's money honey, uh, he, uh, despite being left wing, he in 2006, he wrote a song to her, which I'm going to uh, recite some of the lyrics to, Matt, because I <laughs> yes. know you'll love it. Uh, he says, uh, Joey Ramone. I watch you on the TV every single day. Those eyes make everything okay. I watch her every day. I watch her every night. She's really out of sight. Maria Bartiromo, Maria Bartiromo, Maria Bartiromo. Uh, Bartiromo was the uh, quickest person to, uh, she was talking to the uh, urine uh, drug testing magnate, Rick Scott, Senator of Florida, who's a big, you know, we got to uh, build a big, big wall on the border. 
uh, guy about things when the bridge collapsed. And she said, you know, uh, people are talking about this as having some foul play due to the wide open border on the South. So she immediately invoked the idea that somehow, you know, Mexico was going to get back at America by letting, you know, sneaking people across the border who would then collapse the bridge somehow, even though it was a Singaporean flagged ship that lost control and slammed into it. Uh, it um, that kind of reaction is just a reminder that politics can always be dumber and stupider than you can possibly imagine in any given moment. And um, that is wrong. And we should be thinking about that. And we should also be wary of the immediate responses of people like, uh, you know, the president who immediately went on TV to say, hey, don't worry, we're covering the entire cost. Um, all sorts of things spin out. Uh, attacks on the DEI selected mayor and governor of Maryland somehow. So people who were elected into office are somehow DEI hires. Um, you just see this kind of thing spinning out in such an insane way that even somebody as fundamentally stupid as David Simon, the uh, you know the auteur behind The Wire, which is a great show, actually had a great thread on Twitter saying like, you know, there's going to be an investigation and we will find out what happened. And that's really the starting point for this, other than, you know, kind of uh, saying a prayer for the, uh, you know, for the dead and their families. There's a great scene in front of the bridge in the second season of The Wire, one of the very final episodes where things start to come to a head. Uh, if you want to Great little remembrance of that show and the bridge. Recommend you watch it. Well, so we're talking about how many workers uh, in the in the you know in that um, the the dock workers will be affected by this, and it's like it's eight thousand people. Maybe it's fifteen thousand people, and we're also just already in this place where it's like we will make good on those guys' salaries for as long as it takes, I guess, to rebuild this bridge. Like the the kind of immediate, reflexive, very, very expensive promises that have been made at all levels of government to just like um, cover everybody's costs forever as a result of this uh, of this accident is, you know, it's really troubling. It's like this is, you know, Joe Biden is not like our nice dad who's bailing us out after we got in a little fender bender. Like this is big money. This is like very important stuff. This is people who should probably just retrain for their jobs. Um I will say reasons paper, like the paper that we print the magazine on comes through the Port of Baltimore. So uh, if your magazine looks weird in a couple months, I guess that's what happened. I would uh, point out <clears throat> a couple of things. One is that uh, clearly we continue to lose the argument um, that the federal government should pay for any disaster. I think it was Glenn Garvin, Nick, uh, had a great piece in the 90s yeah. about one, one of the hurricanes. And that was kind of the... Uh, that was the beginning of the end uh, as far as the federal government just assuming that it must repay uh, absolutely everything at all times. Um, this bridge goes between Maryland and Maryland, um, uh, and it's that seems really uh, like cheap skatey to point out um, such mm -hmm. things, but it's also true. And like, what do you have a federal government for? What do you have state and local government for? But again, we lose that argument. I mean, like the federal government through so many uh, hundreds of billions of dollars or, you know, close to $200 billion to K through 12 schools because of COVID. Um, and if you want to see something crazy, watch what happens when that money finally draws uh, down um, mm -hmm. uh, over the next uh, year, year and a half. Uh, it's going to be uh, nuts. All right. Uh, let's and get the, uh, the government did. The feds did pay for the rebuilding of the bridge in Minnesota that collapsed back in uh, 2007. I guess it was the I-35 bridge because there was the perfect mix of a bipartisan congressional delegation from Minnesota to, um, you know, in Washington at the time. So that is also going to be at play here. Whatever we did then, we will do 10 times. Yeah. I mean, um, and like we're the federal government is all in the California high speed rail because Lord knows, uh, you know, you can't get a train from Fresno to Bakersfield without taxpayers from yeah. Massachusetts uh, chipping in. It doesn't make any sense at all. Um, but we're so far removed from a world where people are even conscious of the separate levels of governance. Uh, got a long way ahead. It's a privilege to be outnumbered, Catherine. Um, all right, we're going to get to our listener email of the week here in a moment. But first, friends, do you ever like um, give up a certain substance 
for like a period of time, perhaps connected to a religious sort of observance uh, schedule. Uh, and then only at the end to kind of burst through like the Kool-Aid man come through a wall. And then the next morning you feel like someone hits you in the head with a sack of bricks, for example. Um, it's a rookie move, if we're being honest, uh, although uh, who hasn't had a little youthful exuberance here. But I'm here to tell you right now, there's a way with a little planning and forethought uh, for you to wake up the next morning feeling fresh as a uh, Banaka blast. Um, I'm talking, of course, about Z-Biotics. Z-Biotics pre-alcohol probiotic drink is the world's first genetically engineered probiotic. It was invented by PhD scientists to tackle rough mornings after drinking. Here's how it works. When you drink alcohol, it gets converted into a toxic byproduct in the gut area. It's this byproduct, not dehydration. That's to blame for your rough next day, your theoretical rough next day. Z-Biotics produces an enzyme to break this byproduct down. Just remember to make Z-Biotics your first drink of the night. Then drink responsibly and you'll feel your best tomorrow. Just go to zbiotics.com slash roundtable right now to get 15% off your first order when you use the promo code roundtable at checkout. There's a 100% money back guarantee if you are unsatisfied in any way. No questions asked. That's zbiotics.com slash roundtable, promo code roundtable. Do it today. You'll be glad you did. All right. Reminder, email your queries to roundtable at reason.com. This one comes from Jamie Lewis, who writes, presidential elections usually entail a lot of promises that voters have to just hope candidates will stick to once elected or not. For Uh, For the first time in our lifetimes, that is not all we have to go on. Both major party candidates have been president before. So this time we get to go into an election knowing that they both will be horrible. I find it hard to see a lot of differences between the two. Trump opposed tariffs. Biden has kept them in place. Trump started a wall and it still stands. Trump spent a lot of money. Biden spent a lot of money, etc. Is there anything that either of these two have done as president to secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our pro, uh, posterity. Yeah, Catherine. We got out of Afghanistan, mm-hmm. I guess. That's kind of what I have. Uh, this question. Biden pulled troops out of Afghanistan. True. But, but None to of be us clear, on this podcast. I personally did not get not, out, we're in out of Afghanistan. Afghanistan. Um, I uh, this question uh, from a person that I'm going to lump in with the uh, with the category to which I now pledge full allegiance, which is the double haters. Um, This question really sent me into a spiral of sadness this morning. I'm not (laughs) I'm not going to lie about that. Um, What have either of the last two presidents done to secure the blessings of liberty? And I was like scrounging around in the couch cushions like I. It's tough out here. Um, I do think, you know, Trump's foreign policy uh, was marked by uh, uncertainty and confusion. Uh, He was maybe going to get us out of uh, Afghanistan. Then he wasn't. Then he was. There was a lot of the generals were stopping him. Maybe Um, I've blacked out some of that. I guess I'll have to uh, brush up if he becomes president again. But uh, but Biden did do it. And uh, leaving a, a generational war zone is uh is a true a true success um the best i can think of for trump is probably more of a what didn't happen um i think under his presidency both past and potential future uh lots of regulations that would otherwise have happened didn't happen um we uh can't get in the time machine and see what regulations those would have been but i i do think it is uh broadly true that there are just a bunch of categories where um through a combination of principle and inattention, Trump left people alone in a productive way. There's a strand of the multiverse with a lot more regulations. It's just that that yeah. movie hasn't been made yet. Because no one would go to it because it would be the worst. I've seen every multiverse movie. What about you? Uh, no you no policy one, time heists is did a, you see is the one a where, thing we're not going to do. Did you see the one where the the... Uh, the the co-host of the uh, roundtable answered the question, Peter. Yeah. Oh, you want me to answer the question now? So yeah. uh, uh, 
I think Trump did uh, something that is commendable. I don't know if it's a secured the blessings of liberty, but he signed the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, which is a law that I had a bunch of problems with, but had one very good provision that I have basically no problems with, uh, at least as a standalone. And that is that it lowered the corporate tax rate from about 35% down to 21%, bringing the United States in line with the OECD average. That means that we are no longer uh, competing uh, for business internationally with a one hand tied behind our, behind our backs. This was a permanent change, unlike many of the changes in the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. And it is almost certainly uh, a, a better policy overall and a better way to stimulate domestic corporate growth uh, of the kind that um, – that Biden and Trump have said that they would like to see uh, than what Biden has done with things like the CHIPS Act. And I would actually just recommend to folks uh, listening or watching this podcast uh, to read former Reason intern Alex Muresino. I'm going to not pronounce his name uh, mm. correctly. It might be Maraschino. It might be Muresino. Uh, Natalie Dalzicki, uh, 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 one of my fellow editors, suggested Maraschino this morning. And because that is a cocktail ingredient, we're going to go with Alex Maraschino. Alex, I'm sorry. But he wrote a great piece for the Tax Foundation comparing the uh, the corporate uh, tax cuts in the TCJA with Biden's approach to subsidizing specific corporations and specific projects directly via the Inflation Reduction Act and the Chips and Science Act, and uh, makes a pretty good case that the Trump approach is better and is going to be better overall for the economy because it's just a straightforward supply side approach that doesn't pick winners. It just says if you're doing good stuff, uh, then these uh, th th then this is available to you and this, it's going to go to everybody rather than the government trying to say, oh, this company and this corporation and this project uh, and this manufacturing hub, we're going to invest this number of billions directly right there. That's a bad idea. Trump didn't do it. Um, and it is to his credit, even if I have mixed feelings about the bill as a whole. Nick, secure blessings, liberty, presidents? Uh, you know, Trump was uh, without question uh, the best president on school choice issues uh, in American history. And I don't see that changing, whether he or Biden gets elected uh, next time. Uh, but he was very good on that. And um, to the extent that the, the federal government has anything to do with school policy, which should be zero, but they do have a limited but significant impact, he uh, kind of helped to uh, push uh, school choice ideas behind that and in various kind of funding streams and pilot programs. And uh, Joe Biden... Uh, di has not delivered very well on this, but he has actually changed um, uh, kind of the rhetoric, at the very least, of drug policy. Uh, he admitted that he had been a major problem in his uh, senatorial and vice presidential role roles in um, drug policy. And we are slowly uh, and tepidly and, you know, it's just taking too long, but moving away from a prohibitionist mindset to one that is more about um, um, uh, harm reduction and things like that. So, you know, neither of these are, are huge victories or anything like that, but they're two positive uh, tendencies in each of these terrible presidents, one of whom will be the next president of the U.S. Oh, that's a lot of RFK Jr. erasure, and I'm not here for it, uh, Nick. Um, mm -hmm. I My answer to the question uh, as a literalist is an emphatic no. Uh, I don't see any securing of the blessings of liberty. You know, policy better than others. Um, you know, uh, to Nick's point, uh, getting rid of the Title IX uh, horrible uh, interpretation regulations under Barack Obama that was passed, I believe in 2014, not passed, it was just uh, adopted. Um, rolling that back under Betsy DeVos was great, and it stopped a lot of really, truly anti due process. Uh, uh, terribleness on college campuses, but is it secure? It's, it lasts as long as it takes for Biden to to uh, roll it back. Um, so, like securing the blessings of liberty, the, it's another thing that is no longer talked about. That used to be a part of the rhetorical uh, card in the deck. Um, if you hear it now at all, it'll be in a quote at the end of a speech, and it won't be uh, extrapolated upon at all. Um, it's no longer something that American politicians talk about. And uh, it's part of the reason why we don't have presidents who do that uh, anymore, if we ever did. All right. Would you say that America is insecure in the blessings of liberty? Yeah. Literally, yeah. yes. Excellent. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Thank that's, you. Uh, that's fine. All right. Uh, speaking of insecure blessings, that's not the right transition. Let's start that over again. Uh, last week, 
uh, former senator and Democratic vice presidential nominee Joe Lieberman fell down and died at age 82. Uh, Lieberman held public office for four decades. Kind of forget all that. He was in the Connecticut State Senate. He was the attorney general of that state. He was the United States senator first as a Democrat and then after he got primaried by Ned Lamont uh, over the Iraq war, basically, um, then ran as an independent and beat Lamont and retained a seat until, uh, I think, 2013. Um, the last decade of his life, he was uh, the head of the uh, curious nonprofit, No Labels, um, uh, which may or may not nominate a presidential <laughs> ticket this year. We still don't really know. Um, there's been a lot of chatter that I've seen, at least, uh, to the effect of that Lieberman's passing is part of the end of an era. Uh, Nick, what's one thing we can say about that era and of uh, old uh, Joe's uh, role in it? Uh, Joe Lieberman was arguably the leading force in the Senate uh, to uh, censor popular culture, both through shaming, but also uh, working at various points to try and expand the uh, the mandate of uh, the FCC over things like cable and the internet. He was very popular and in favor of the Communications Decency Act and things like that. I remember him mostly as the guy who, along with William Bennett, the uh, former drug czar and secretary of education, who kind of faded from public life after it came out that he was a big gambler, um, that they used to give out uh, for a while in the 90s something called the Silver Sewer Awards, which were uh, given every year to uh, the person they thought was most responsible for degrading American culture through whatever they did. And in 1999, they gave it to uh, Fox uh, Network. And this was the broadcast network. They were talking about Rupert Murdoch. And uh, Joe Lieberman uh, said that they had done, he had done more than any other programmer in television to foul the public airwaves and define our cultural norms down. And uh, at this point, uh, Rupert Murdoch was merely 68, but he had just married uh, Wendy Deng uh, at 32. And this is how Joe Lieberman uh, uh, codified or, or said this is what Rupert Murdoch had done. Orgasmic moans, incestuous leering, urinating for revenge. Nothing seems too cheap or degrading to be played for a laugh. Um, and that was Joe Lieberman. That That's him in a nutshell. He was a sour puss who hated the very culture that was born by you know the the freedom and innovation of american ingenuity even when it came from people from australia like rupert murdoch i just am very excited about the concept of urinating for revenge uh, yeah that's from a uh that was from a short-lived uh fox program whose name i'm forgetting that starred jay moore the long forgotten oh. comic yeah, uh, he played like guy. an aggressive sports agent because it was somehow tied into his small role in Jerry Maguire. But um, there was not a, a, you know, an uncouth word that had been uttered in music or TV or movies that could go unnoticed by Joe Lieberman. Peter, I'm sure you didn't unnotice uh, uh, Vinegar Joe's work on uh, video games. Talk about that. Yeah, Lieberman was the great congressional scourge of the video game industry starting in the early 1990s with a pretty famous or infamous, I should say, hearing on video games in 1993. Among the video games that were included were Mortal Kombat, which is a franchise that is still going today, uh, and also Night Trap. And this is the one that people always forget about because no one had played Night Trap. Okay, not literally zero people. That is an exaggeration. But no one had played Night Trap. Trap. And among other things, it was clear that none of the Congress critters who were complaining about Night Trap had played it. Because what this game was, was it was a sort of interactive video game with early digitized video that was then kind of choose your own adventure and you could sort of play through this. And they made it look like the goal of the game was to like sneak into women's bedrooms and kill them while they were scantily clad. And there were, in fact, shots of scantily clad women uh, in bedrooms. But you, the goal was to save them. The goal was to save them from the vampires who were going to kill them if you didn't go in. Now, this was beyond Joe Lieberman and his Ken. He was just like, wow, this is not this is not at all OK. Um, and he, you know, he also he showed on the uh, the on congressional floor, he showed video of early Mortal Kombat uh, gameplay, which included, of course, in the, the original the Mortal Kombat series is known for 
pretty bloody, sort of comically gory uh, kill moves called fatalities at the end, right? You rip people's he- hearts out or like uh, take grab their skull and like rip it off their body and then there's like a, you know, a spine still hanging down. It's kind of ridiculous. It's kind of gross. This is what the series is known for. It's absolutely um, a juvenile and adolescent and designed to provoke. But Joe Lieberman took the bait very much. And, it, and then what happened as a result of this that I think is kind of funny uh, that people forget about is that as the Mortal Kombat games became a franchise, it, they didn't just keep the uh, the fatalities in place. The mortal, the second uh, game in particular had had finishing moves that were really friendly. Like you could do like hearts and bunnies to people, and these were called a. Uh, friendtalities or friendship moves or something like this. And this was explicitly in reaction to Joe Lieberman. So you do have to credit him for uh, inspiring some great, funny video game design. Uh, Catherine, how do you remember Joe Lieberman? I'm actually distracted by the fact that Suderman's description of what was it called? Night? Night trap. Night trap. Uh, Our entire culture, uh, at least our teen girl culture, subsequently reoriented around like the vampire sneaking into your bedroom at night is the best possible thing that could happen to you. Like, thank you, Twilight, for that. So I guess maybe that's Joe Lieberman's fault, too. Now we know which team you're on. Uh, It's not Team Jacob. I've definitely always been on Team Vampire, and that's not even controversial. Uh, I wanted to say something nice about a dead person, unlike y'all. And so Joe Lieberman did... Uh, routinely try to uh, support and then later revive DC's uh, school voucher program. So this was, um, you know, uh, for a while, a kind of football that got tossed around on the Hill a lot. Um, The unions, of course, hated it because of DC's special status. It was sort of easy to um, authorize and then uh, revoke this funding. Um, Among other things, uh, Lieberman, I I found by searching my name and his name on the Reason website, um, I wrote about a time that he just tried to sneak the funding for this into the reauthorization of the uh, of the FAA. So uh, I guess like (laughs) thanks. Thanks, Joe Lieberman, for that. Um, it was that's 20, how you do the lawmaking. Twenty million dollars. Yeah. Just he just like threw it in there. Uh, he did. He was not successful at that time. But I appreciate that he tried. Thanks, Joe. If you want a nice remembrance of him, I would recommend John Podoritz's uh, uh, remembrance at Commentary. Podoritz was a personal friend and speaks to the way that Lieberman was, uh, by all accounts, um, a likable and decent person uh, in private life uh, and also had a little bit of a, a sense of humor about his own reputation uh, at, at a wedding for, I, I believe, his daughter. I, I might be messing that up, but for a, for a child, I believe, um, he gave a speech in which he promised that he would give them an earmark. Which is which is pretty funny. Uh, I would anti recommend a piece I haven't even read, but Nick showed to me on Slack just before we started uh, by Mark McKinnon, the hat wearing political centrist Mm -hmm. um, in Vanity Fair saying Joe Lieberman was the best of them. And there's not a close second an appreciation by a fellow political centrist. Um, And sorry to be a jerk, but uh, Mark McKinnon's political centrism is not my flavor. Um, One thing that that Joe Lieberman did do as part of No Labels and as a senator for a long time, um, and this is pretty consistent with this kind of fading brand of muscular centrism, is that at least he talked and No Labels talked a lot about um, uh, the need to reform entitlements, that entitlements, spending, mandatory spending. Um, on Social Security and uh, Medicare, Medicaid uh, is a problem um, and this demographic problem needs to be addressed and fixed. Uh, again, to the theme of old timey stuff that people no longer even pretend to care about. Uh, at least he pretended uh, and I think he actually did uh, care about that. The one uh, other two other things about him. One is just that he's 82. He fell over. He died. It's a reminder that our olds, my dad, you know, one year ago and he's 85 now. Um, fell over and it was pretty bad there, touch and go. People in their 80s fall and hurt themselves and um, we're nominating two pretty old guys um, who will, will be uh, president if they live that long in their 80s. One of them already is. Um, so just to, you know, Joe Lieberman was hail uh, as these things go uh, two weeks ago. Um, and then the other is that there's this uh, brand of kind of... Uh, uh, alternative history making that people engage in sometimes about the John McCain campaign in 2008, which I covered a little bit. Um, and it's about his vice presidential pick. By all accounts, uh, Joe Lieberman was in the finals uh, of that pick. It would have been controversial at the time, certainly. Um, and uh, it ended up being Sarah Palin instead. I think there's a 
there's a category of people who think like, oh, we could have had a completely different politics because once we had Sarah Palin, then this new kind of showy, uh, glitzy and shallow populism on the right became ascendant and that was a bad thing. Um, I don't think, uh, and I don't know but at all, uh, but I don't think that Lieberman was ever really a strong candidate to be. Uh, McCain in his uh, final uh, book uh, talked about that that was his biggest regret of that campaign. Um, but uh, I, I don't think that he would have uh, uh, nominated him. But I also don't think that even if he had, it would have changed much except that he would have lost by more um, because there would have been a lot of people uh, in the Republican Party in the base who already didn't trust McCain very much at all, who wouldn't be very, very happy with uh, having a lifelong Democrat there. Um, and also wouldn't have stopped the tide of Republican kind of showbiz populism either. I'm a firm believer of the demand side of American politics being as much, if not more, of the problem, or at least a driver of the problems. So that's all I have to say about Joe Lieberman, RIP, and so forth. Um, let's go to our end of podcast, what we've all been consuming in the cultural arena. Uh, Nick, want to Elias off? Yeah, I read uh, a new book by Lisa Selen Davis, who's a journalist and author who uh, before this wrote a book called Tomboy, which was an interesting exploration of uh, the intersection of tomboys of growing up a tomboy having a daughter who was kind of a tomboy and uh, uh interest or uh issues about trans uh childhood and things like that uh the new book is called housewife why women still do it all and what to do instead um it's an interesting cultural history of the concept of housewife uh a reason uh, staffer liz wolf appears in this book under a uh a fake name uh, anybody who's interested will be able to figure it out, I think. Uh, but um, it's an interesting uh, cultural history of the concept of housewife, uh, particularly in its kind of post-World War II phenomenon. Um, I found that part of the book very interesting. Uh, her policy prescriptions, including the fact that uh, the idea that women still do it all, um, I don't particularly agree with her analysis it, You know, in the uh, first case, but then her policy prescriptions veer very far away from anything that would be, uh, you know, remotely libertarian. She's not a libertarian and doesn't pretend to be one. So that's kind of interesting to run through those policy proposals and see uh, which one of them are, uh, uh, you know, are gaining ground or are publicly or popularly, uh, you know, are popular among uh, the average uh, average American. Um, but um, I recommend Housewife why women still do it all and what to do instead, especially as a uh, as a, an interesting kind of, uh, you know, conception of why we think we have the, the gender roles or why we have the kind of pre-existing gender roles that we do in marriages. Catherine, what did you consider? I played a board game and I'm going to recommend it to you guys. Uh, it's been a while since I've uh, rolled up here with a board game recommendation, and I'm sorry for those of you that were depending on me, all two of you. Um, this board game is called Wavelength, uh, and it is absolutely delightful. It, it the, the selling point of this board game, I think for many people, is it takes literally 30 seconds to figure out how to play it. So if you are a person that's like, hey, I might theoretically be open to like playing a game after dinner with my friends or family. But if you start like handing out 14 different kinds of cards and 17 different kinds of tokens and you're like making a map on the table and that stresses <laughs> you out, this is the opposite of that. Um, and it is uh, the concept of the game is that you get a dichotomy. Um, so overrated, underrated, dangerous job, safe job, talent, skill, whatever. Um, and then you have a kind of dial that you turn um, and you have to try and name something uh, on that spectrum in a particular place and then other people guess. So dangerous job, safe job. Uh, you know, if the needle is all the way toward dangerous job, I might say uh, assassin. And then the other people have to guess where exactly how dangerous I think being an assassin is. It's fun. It's one of those games where you have to like. Wait, you don't have to guess. How dangerous assassins are. Yeah, I feel like you have a really good sense. I mean, I can't speak to my off off duty activities and will not admit anything here. Um, but uh, it's it's one of those games where you have to like stare into the eyeballs of the other person and try to figure out what they're thinking. And it's fun. Um, it is part of like the great 
the great golden age of board games that we are still experiencing. Uh, we talk a lot about the golden age of television and video games and all kinds of other stuff, but uh, board games are just as awesome right now. So wavelength for your after dinner, short game, low stress needs. I was just now uh, imagining a reboot of The Americans, Nick, um, yeah. but, but with uh, Catherine uh, Mangu Ward character who edits a libertarian magazine by day and then just straight up assassinates people by night. Uh, I will say my my sisters, uh, my sister and her family were in town this weekend. Uh, and there is there is a special joy in playing this game uh, with either a sibling or a spouse because, uh, you know, too much. Um, so <laughs> so there's there's that as well. Yeah, and by I assassinates don't... people, you mean fellow podcasters? Yeah. <laughs> yes. I was going towards a different group. But anyways, uh, Peter, what did you consume? I read Tana French's new novel, The Hunter. It is excellent. It's just so satisfying and engrossing in so many ways. Uh, like all of her novels, it is a crime story. This one is set in a small town in Ireland, and it is about the ways in which thick communities, small towns in which everyone knows each other and relies on each other. There's something um, there's something wonderful about those communities and they have clear benefits. Uh, there's, there's something really comforting about it. But there are also real downsides and frankly, even dark sides. Uh, and those communities can come together for nefarious purposes um, as well as for good ones. And so this is just a, a, a psychologically astute, pleasantly twisty and pleasurable novel to read. Um, and moreover, I, I would recommend uh, all of her novels. This is, I believe, her nine um, so if you haven't read any ton of French novels, start with the first. You will plow through them. They are just an absolute delight. Uh, they are, they're all crime thrillers, mostly murder mysteries, especially the first six. Um, I think along with Neil Stevenson at this point, she is probably my favorite working novelist. Uh, I engaged in a pseudotastic uh, activity, cultural activity, on uh, Friday uh, here. I was uh, gifted a VIP tour of a distillery. The uh, Kings Ooh. County Distillery here in Brooklyn, New York. Nice. It's the first uh, distillery, I believe, in New York City since uh, Prohibition. Mm. How about that? Um, uh, it's over in uh, the Brooklyn Navy Yard, right next to Wegmans, Nick. Uh, yeah. And, and uh, there's, they have a little gatehouse um, right as you're driving in uh, that has a sweet uh, bar where they serve only, they make a whiskey there. I got five different uh, uh, grades, uh, uh, styles of it, and they make only cocktails uh, from at that bar using their uh, on on the spot made whiskey products. And I had a perfect Manhattan there, and I was uh, accurately named, like absolutely best Manhattan I've ever had in my life. So, do you know what makes it perfect? Uh, it's like uh, no, tell us. So it's it's that typically a Manhattan is a combination of whiskey and sweet vermouth and bitters. And with a perfect Manhattan, you take that sweet vermouth portion and you split it half and half with dry vermouth. There we go. Um, I thought it was that you squeezed our former intern, Alex Maraschino, into yes. the uh, drink. Well, that's, that's just for the garnish. I, it's one of my favorite uh, songs on Led Zeppelin, too. Um, so uh, it was great. They have these. Uh, they offer a couple of tours. One is the distillery tour for 45 mm -hmm. minutes. Another one, the top shelf distillery tour for 75 minutes. It's a pretty small facility, um, big copper things and tubes and whatnot and mashes. And they will tell you about the history of prohibition and New York's uh, unique roles and all this kind of stuff. And also, most importantly, especially if you go with a group of friends, it's always fun just to like measure the volume of the room as you <laughs> as you go through the little shot tasting process like the first one's like oh yes this is a this moonshine variant is quite good and by the shot number 5 it's like yeah the fashion <laughs> it's really good um and uh, uh, I, I highly recommend it uh, very fun um good little way to spend time and uh, if any of you do decide to do that uh, shoot me an email and I'll tell you about the place where you should go to dinner afterwards to uh, fill what's your, your what's your email Matt? Um, I'm uh, publicly available on uh, on on the internet. You can find me, Matt Did they let you? Did they let you dip your hands into the beer well? So some distilleries do this. You have the sour mash that is um, got to be reduced and and distilled, and they've got you know sort of these giant what they call beer wells. It's not actually beer like we think of beer. It's this sort of corny mush stuff uh, with a 
uh, sort of uh, layer on top, uh, like as, as the yeast is sort of doing its work. And you can, and they're just these giant, sometimes you can be 10, 12 feet across, and you just put your hand in it because, right, this stuff is going to be heated and sort of recooked and distilled a bunch of times. There's basically, it's it basically impossible to get infected. So, you know, you can cough in it if you want, right? Like, and you, you just go and you can taste like what what this stuff was before it was whiskey and the, um, you know, and, and taste what the mash bill is like. It's really interesting. Thanks. I uh, hate whiskey now. That description was the worst thing I've ever heard. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they didn't offer me the opportunity to cough into the mash. Uh, but did that, did that, could you like swim across one of the vats then, Matt, or something? <laughs> uh, no, they do have no. uh, two uh, little like rescue distillery cats uh, oh, who are yeah. crawling around there yeah. and their names are Harold and Maude. Nick, you'll be happy mm. to know. Um, so all right. Nice. That's all. The uh, the early 70s, or was it late 60s, a uh, movie uh, reference? Early 70s. We have time for here on the, who is the director of that, Nick? Uh, Hal important? Ashby. Hal yeah. Ashby, thank you. Yeah. Um, I just, you know, sometimes you have to, like, just to see whether the pop culture forever yeah. machine is still working in Nick's but it's brain. The, and it, and it I mean, it's obviously the Yusuf Islam soundtrack that sells that movie, Matt Well, Absolutely mm -hmm. correct. Um, here. All right. Uh, thank you for listening this week. We'll be back next week. We're back every week as far as i can tell uh yeah. stretching into the uh, multiverse future Until the court orders are lifted yeah <laughs> uh <laughs> all of our podcasts and there's just lots of them too many to enumerate uh exist at reason.com slash podcasts please go there uh for that we also have lots of events that are available at reason.com events are there any that you would like to hype in particular nick gillespie uh, sure. We've got an event on April 15th in New York City with Jonathan Haidt, which is currently sold out, but we're build we're going to build out a wait list. So if oh. people, uh, you know, pull a Joe Lieberman or something and the seats <laughs> open up, uh, you might be able to get in that way. And then we also, on, uh, in, later in May, this will go up uh, within a day or two of listing. We're going to be uh, doing a live uh, speakeasy interview with Glenn Greenwald, oh. who... Uh, will no doubt be throwing uh, more than a few bombshells, uh, but that'll be in late May, uh, May 21st, to be exact. But go to reason.com slash events or go to uh, Reason's newsletters page, reason.com slash newsletters, and sign up for a variety of newsletters there, including the New York City events newsletter. And if you like what we do, you can uh, uh, give us money to do more of it, reason.com slash donate. It's fun. Silver? Does silver work, Matt? Everything. Uh, bit silver is the best. Uh, colloidal current. silver. Can I, uh, I have a lot of colloidal silver I want to unload. It's a uh, Y2K. Important. It's vintage now. I got the boots for you. Uh, all right. We'll see you next week. Goodbye.